to Tone Dog. Oh, we got a lot of people all across the country. We getting a breath of fresh air. Shout out to everybody out there. Out there. We got people all across this country ready to have a conversation. Compton in the house. Compton in the house. Woo-wee. Look. P said we back. So look. I want to have a conversation today. It's a somber conversation. That's why I started off with a little bit of a lighter, you know, opening. But I need you guys to understand the gravity of the moment. ADOS working age blacks are on the verge of collapse, if not collapse in many of y'all households. One of the things I wanted to do with this project from the outset was to start explaining it, how much of it isn't your fault. We all have to bear responsibility for choices, but what we're looking at is a, a, a monumental global slash national shift while all while people want to make race a historical project in the middle of a moment where race is the most important financial aspect of your life. Um, you know, and it's weird because one of the things that is is happening is we have decided that we are superheroes immersed in poverty with no superpowers hmm we got a working age black population that largely has no wealth no pension and ain't dealing with the fact of how that affects the structure of what your family should look like just went out and did it anyway now i'm not saying i want to see less ados babies but what I am saying is them babies cost. And what we about to do is have a discussion breaking out the data, breaking out the wealth, breaking out the stories of how that's impacting lives as everything from housing to cars to food jump exponentially. Can we talk about it? This is Antonio Moore coming to you from Tone Talks. Um, I'm looking forward to having a great discussion today. I got a, a a lot of people in the chat. I always appreciate y'all, man. Y'all give the support and the love. I got a story up that we're going to go through as an anchor to the discussion, but we're going to go much broader. Please start off by sharing this. Subscribe, press the button and the bell, and then share this. And please also press the like and uh, and uh, call in 310-388-3499. Shout out to Cuz Old Chase. He gave me some new beats. I know I'll be having the beats in the opening. That come from Cuzzo Chase down there in Atlanta. Um, shout out to him. Got a couple new ones. I'm gonna use one today. Um, I got some new intros. I got some new animated intros. Give y'all a little something to bounce to when you come in. Um, let me start off by saying thank you to Steve Mayfield. Shout out to you and to White Johnson. And thank you to Boomerhead. Boomer Hooks. I'm sorry. Boomer Hooks. She done named herself Boomer Hook. Oh Jesus. Thank you so much. Um, we gonna have this discussion. I see Ados North in here. Boomer Hook in here. Ah, uh, we gonna have this discussion. How many of y'all seen this article? Meet a millennial who's turning 40, starting yet another new career. One of the things that I said in a tweet as I shared this article from Fortune that detailed the narrative and the story of this young man's life is, there's no set of projects that has explained the collapse coming to Black America the way myself and Breaking Brown, which is Yvette Carnell's channel, have for the last decade. Meet a millennial who is turning 40, starting yet another new career, and has $47,000 in debt. That's the, the title of the article. Now, this isn't, to me, a story about a man as much as a moment. A moment that we are immersed in that far too many people don't even understand they're immersed in. How many of y'all looking for tomorrow because today ain't right? Put your hand up in the chat. You're looking forward to tomorrow because today ain't right. Well, you need a body of politics that comes out of joining your civic institutions, joining your black churches, however you feel about them, joining the ADOS Foundation and pushing for and anchoring for a black agenda and reparations, being part of politics and part of community. What we see far too often, and we're going to come back to this article, is we don't understand. And one of the things that I want to do, we got hands up in the chat. We got hands up. 
Come on. Everybody, I'm seeing the hands. One of the things that I try to do for all of you, for myself, is anchor this whole thing in the data that nobody else in America has. Ain't no 1619. Ain't no BLM. Ain't no, ain't no doing this kind of anchoring of why your life is so hard. So you understand what part of that you need to own. Come on. America failed Adolf, Black America. In response, we blamed ourselves. My project, Tone Talks, more than anything else, is an attempt to provide some solace to a working age Black America that will be forced to face itself with an economic reckoning that isn't in the future. It's now. So as I started to frame this thing and tell you guys, no, white people didn't always have $127 trillion. They used to have billions. No, um, the middle black family is not worth seventeen dollars or $18,000. Let me show you the breakdown. They're worth two when you take that family car out. Oh, nobody showed you that before? Yeah. Okay. When I brought Thomas Shapiro on, when I introduced concepts that, that connected to the dots were, you know, uh, the dream hoarders. The only the top 20% of white families have all of the access to an American dream. Part of this concept in this project was to take data to break it out. When I did the report, report with Darity, the report and did the Fortune article, and we started framing that there is no black business in America, that black celebrity is a con built to make you feel that black folks have access that they never had access. Can we talk? Y'all in the chat? I see y'all. But as I did that, you guys wanted to find a middle ground between me and the high school dropout. Bruh, stop. You have to siphon off the mess. You have to siphon off people that are basically out here talking Griffin and Graham and they never built nothing or done nothing. I'm just telling you how this go. Now, ain't nothing wrong with, per se, dropping out of high school if you go get your GED and you try to get your life together. But the discussion we having is a sacrifice of when you go further. And when you can tell people about licensing music, I put it on Twitter. You know, I license um, the song I Wish for Ski, for Ski Low. I cleared that song up for Ski so he could go as a black man and get his licensing because he had the master, but it wasn't clear. I had to go clean some samples up and shit. Then I licensed it to 21 Jump Street, the movie, and also to, uh, to Toyota. To, but this is the kind of level I would like to talk to more black physicians about COVID rather than black folks talking about melanins or uh, schools starting. To, I don't want to talk about none, none of them people. But we have made a world where black academics don't feel they have a voice with you because you listen to everything and then try to find your own middle ground. No, there are experts and then there are laymen. And then there are people below laymen that lay below the men. Can we talk? Can we talk about it today? Because part of what we're doing right now is we build it. But as we build this thing, I need you to understand I'm building minds on data, on charts that I created for you to see it. I did this chart based on the Federal Reserve data, broke it down to show you to see how this wealth is broken down. White folks are the green. They got 84% of all the wealth. Black folks are the red, and they got 4%. But 2% of that is pension. Probably 3.1% is in the hands of people that don't work no more. Boomer age, uh, greatest gens that are dying out, they got all the wealth. And not, they didn't go to all the college, but they got all the wealth. You have a working age Black America that has not faced this truth and does not understand the consequence that is coming today in this show. We're going to make that consequence clear. Can I make it clear today? Because a lot of y'all are living on your parents' pensions. Let me talk about it. 
Now, I don't mean that in the sense of the check coming through. I mean in that in the sense of the feeling that you're stable and comfortable. You comfortable because your parents is comfortable, but you ain't stable. You don't know where your rent coming from. You ain't got no retirement. Um, come on. You ain't got no savings. Your health insurance is shaky, but you all right because your mama all right. Now, I'm not wishing that you don't want your mama to be all right. But your all right and your mama all right are two different things, baby. Let's talk about it today, millennials. Let's talk about it, all oh, young Gen Xers. A lot of black people out here getting real today. But we going to get honest. 310-388-3499, call in. Give us your testimonial. But when we talked about it, what made it different is we brought it to data. Ray Diallo does his chart. In this chart, he shows what I'm talking about over time. This chart is why your life is hard. I've shown it before. There's new people here. It's okay if you don't understand. You can admit in the chat if you don't understand. But when you don't understand, you got to be quiet then. You can't talk through your lack of understanding. Um, yeah, uh, uh uh-huh you got to be quiet because this chart requires you to understand not try to talk through your understanding can i talk this chart shows how they broke your life now there's a whole nother reality of being ados and not getting reparations and the lack of of overall assistance to us and the the lack of recognition of what slavery means. Everybody wants to do a history project. 1619 is a history project. The question is, what about now, baby? When we demanded reparations, when we demanded ADOS, they told us it was a litmus test. But now they understand and they saying it ain't a litmus test. No, it's just the reality of why you bring up slavery. There is a reason that Harvard came after Adolf, came after Yvette Carnell, came after Antonio Moore with things they then had to retract. We ain't finished yet. Because when you're talking truth, you bring in the hammer to the to the world. But let's talk about this chart. Because I know some people, it's, it, 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 it's, it's a lot of colors and numbers and lines, but the bottom is, is, is years. It's years. Then there's percentages across the side, vertical line. So the horizontal is years. The vertical is percentages. Well, there, there is a reality of the share of wealth held by the top point one of American families. Top point one. Few families. And how much wealth is held by the bottom 90? The last time those numbers were the same was the depression. The next time that they are the same is your life. Come on. If you look, there's a third line that's missing from this chart. In the final version, I may cut in a chart that shows you the third line, which is the 9.9. So the top. 10% or so of white families overall, I think they got like 70, 75%. They got a lot of the wealth, like 75% of it. We have nearly no families that break into that. Only 5% of black black households, primarily boomers, break $350,000 in net worth. But all your dreams cost a million dollars. But this chart, focusing in, that excludes the 9.9, just looks at the 0.1 and the 90. It tells us a particular kind of story. Now, I want you to understand, even if you were to look at us in the 90, again, the 90 is the red line. Uh, To be in this 90, the top of it is like $800,000, $700,000 in net worth. The middle is like 140. Only about 10% of black families break the middle of the bottom line. And it ain't you. You've got a generation of black folks sitting here with kids, wives, husbands with no savings, and they ain't marching. 
You march when somebody gets shot down, but you don't march when your stomach is rumbling. Let me say it again. You march when somebody gets shot down, but you don't march when your stomach rumbling. Can we talk? Can I get some fires? I'm about to get into it. So let's talk about this chart because I talked about it before, but we get this frames for you to understand any boomer or great gen that says you ain't working hard enough, the nonsensical way that they talking to you. So after the depression, FDR, programs like affirmative action, what it led to is, so let's go back. These lines cross. What that crossing represents is that's when the bottom 90 and the top 0.1 of families, of families, there's 83 million white homes, 20 million black, and then let's say there's another uh, 18, 20 million Latino. What's that? 83. That's about 120. Then you got other 140. So we talking about the top 0.1 of those 140 million families. They held the same amount of wealth as the bottom 90%. Now, it was less families back then when we're looking back in 1940, but I'm giving you the gist of it so you can see. All them families had the same amount of wealth. That is a immense amount of inequality. Your life is going to be hard. And when I say hard, Riverbank living hard. Spam, and hopefully you eat hard. Over the course from 1940 all the way to 1980 when Reagan is elected, programs were put in place to split all that up. Taxes were taken. They started taxing money like you've never seen before. And what it led to is we went from the bottom 90 and the top 0.1. You can go right over for yourself, having, what is it, right about 18% of the wealth to, like each to the bottom 90 sharing 35% of the wealth. And the top 0.1 only having what? Probably like 9%. That's still too much. But in that world, your dreams make sense, even as an ADOS. In that world, your grandmama that talk about wooden pennies can get a house in Los Angeles. In that world, you leave college, not as an indentured servant, but as a person that can input your skills into the community. That's not our world. As a result of a failure of politics from Jesse Jackson to Barack Obama and everything in between since ADOS, before ADOS, let me say that. You have a failure post Reagan as deregulation, as Obama handed all them white folks $25 trillion. Go look at the chart. Between Barack Obama, Trump, and Biden, they took white folks from right around $58, $59 trillion after the recession to $127 trillion. Them three presidents, two Dems. But let's look at it. We go from the bottom 90 having 35% of the wealth to now, and I believe it's crossed. This is actually prior to the pandemic. The bottom 90 probably having... I would say less than 20% of the wealth and the top 0.1 having well over 22% of the wealth. In that world, your life is going to be hard as anyone who doesn't get inheritance. But as an Adolf that doesn't get inheritance, it's a wrap if you don't do politics. Can we talk about it? So you can ask me any specific question you want. But in this world, and I said coming reality when I wrote it, it is the reality now as we look at it post-pandemic. This was, I made this chart probably about three years ago. Great Depression, baby. Are you ready mentally? What do we do next? Adolf Foundation. But you ain't got to take my chart for it. And again, that was done by Ray Viallo, and I added significant amount of graphics for you to see it better. Again. That yellow part is important. Current black psyche based on time of wealth sharing. All this affirmative action, all this labor unions. This is gig work here. So let's not ask questions about why this is happening and start to understand what we got to do to change it. I just need you guys to see this chart for a second. We brought this up too, because all of this is the anchoring for the show. Household wealth. In 1950, altogether, 
Look at if it. They had $130 billion with a B. With a B. $130 billion. We get to 1980, and we then, as we come to Reagan, cost to the trillion dollar range at two. Two trillion. We come back to this chart. We come back to this. And what you see is your world is in such a different map that your grandmama can't tell you nothing no more. She can't tell you nothing, but baby, wings fly. Because we move from 130 billion overall, B, to 2 trillion overall, to 3 trillion overall, to a world that we live in now, let's talk about it, where Barack Obama, Biden, Trump together, and it's higher than this now, have white folks with $127 trillion. Almost 40 to 50 trillion of it being liquid. When you look at the cost of America, the cost of America are not set based on just random ideas. It is a price set by the market. So white folks are, are basically inheriting wealth, especially ones that go to college, and you ain't inheriting nothing. And if you don't inherit nothing, you probably out. You don't have to, you don't have to believe me. You just figure it out in your life. Look at this. So we go from three by 1989, we're at 25 for whites. Reagan deregulation, all kinds of schemes and scams to grow money, printing money. We get all the way here. And let's zoom in. And white folks have nearly 75 trillion. Obama is elected because there's a collapse right here. This is where Obama's elected, right around here. White folks is collapsing. He tells us that we can't get reparations. He tells white folks, I'm going to give you some money. I'm going to give you the reparations I said black folks can't get. Let me look over here make sure everybody feeling this chat. Because it is important to understand this before we get to the granular about rents and foods and cars. Because if you don't see this, you're going to blame yourself. So all of this is Barack Obama, Trump, and Biden. And it's now to the point where they have white America has $127 trillion. Black America has seven, and almost half of it is pension. Can we talk about it? Black Americans are being priced out of pandemic housing. 310-388-3499. I want to hear from you. Caller, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Yes, my name is Jerry. I'm calling from Port St. Louis, Florida. Uh, but go ahead. Give me your give me your take on things. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, yes, um, I'm really enjoying your show. I listen to you quite often. I lived on uh, 8th Street when I was in Los Angeles for six years. So I know what it's like out in LA, but I'm in Port St. Louis, Florida. Now, and uh, I'm a retired military guy. And uh, I'm disabled. You know, and uh, I'm grateful that my daughter get to go to college and don't have to pay student loans because of my disability. But listen to you talk about our culture have an issue with trying to look like they're rich and your statistics is on point. I've been listening to you for a long time in the books that you requested for us to read. Uh, I've purchased those and learned how to save money and build well. You know, but I'm retired, so I'm not pointing fingers at anybody, but it's just that our culture is, is, is we we in a crisis. Man. Hey, caller, I got about 20 people in this call. I got 20 people in this queue. I didn't realize because it wasn't showing them all. I want to get to them. Man, I appreciate you. Let me say this, man. I appreciate you supporting me. I know I'm a lot younger than you, and it takes a lot for an older man to at least let somebody younger than them teach them some stuff they might not know, and hopefully I can learn from you as well. Thank you so much for calling. Let me get some more callers in here. We're going to go back to back. Caller, what's your name? Where you calling from? Hey, this is Rasheed. You like this? Rasheed Gatson over here from uh, uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Go so um, I'm calling in. I'm calling in because I literally just, like, just got off of work a little while ago, and I thought it was crazy because um, a lot of my a lot of my buddies, uh, we're all talking about you know the next part of our lives and you know, like what's happening. And I thought it was crazy that I was talking to my friends, and I'm like, yeah, so, uh, you know, college tuition is going up. Uh, you guys can barely afford your student, um, your student loan debt. Uh, 
and the one that's for the folks that actually did go to college. But most of us didn't go to college, and most of us have jobs that pay like you know, it's, it's like it's like the forty for a family. And it was just funny that I was talking to them, and I'm saying like you know, like these are all the things that um, the group Adolf has been talking about for the last like three or four years that they've been you know like uh, in the you know, newspapers they've been having documentaries made about that you know like four channels talking about them and all that good stuff. And, you know, it was funny because, like, everyone was like, oh, well, you know, like, uh, we're on the road to millionaires, that is, right? And it's like, so the whole thing with the stock market just happened. All of these folks got super wealthy. Uh, uh, the head of Moderna is, like, uh, 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 selling off all of his stocks and just taking his money and getting out before the vaccine, stop being forced at everybody. And I'm just like, yo, none of y'all are rich. Hey, <laughs> hey, like, hey, yo, like, hey, and we come back to it, only 5% of black households break $350,000 in net worth. They have recreated themselves as powerless superheroes. They are not waiting on inheritance from grandma. It, it is all wild speculation. And the problem that I see happening, this is the problem I see happening. It isn't just today. We are on the horizon of a great mass Black depression because a lot of Black folks built themselves for tomorrow and tomorrow has become today. So they built themselves that tomorrow they was going to have a million dollars. But today they driving gig, a gig job. And so like, as they start realizing how permanent this is, I just hope a lot of them don't, you know, go through massive bouts of mental issues and depression because they built themselves in such a way where only success can be acceptable in a world that is pushing out and passing out failure. Go ahead. I'll let you have one last word. So I think the I think something that's really you know that passes over people is that they see themselves as having opportunity uh, to get you know to the next step. And I think it's I think something that you said before that, that's really been sticking with me is like um, Ted Bundy was a shoe sale, right? And when I think about my own father, he was working at Radio Shack, had a house, cars, and was raising his three kids. And it just comes to me and you know, and I'm like my buddy are way higher educated than any of our uh, parents. Uh, we've had more experiences, a more places. Yeah, but none of, that that ma- none of that matters. It, all that matters, because when you're living in another time, it's almost like, it's almost... Exactly, I know. you living in a when time where... The where see, they, they were living in a time where labor paid for things. We're living in a time where labor is the, is the icing to a cake of inheritance that pays for things. As ADOS. And nobody's getting inheritance. No, black. Black. Go ahead. <laughs> All right, man. <laughs> Woo, let's take another caller. We got a whole queue. I mean, come on. Caller, what's your name? Where you calling from? Hi, so this is uh, Antoine calling in from Seattle. Give me your take on things. Yeah, no, I just wanted to throw in my two cents. And, you know, I, I just don't think a lot of people. Uh, Adolf's people understand the severity of what already is and what and what's going to intensify because I was in Seattle and rent, let alone purchasing a home in Seattle is, is, is outrageous. I mean, we're talking about people outbidding each other for a home in excess of a million dollars. And this is cash. And it's just... And people just don't get it. And, and you know what frustrates me is just even now listening to your show, there seems to be so much dialogue going on in the chat, and it's useful, right, because people are passing on information, but there's still, like, this sort of immaturity where people are, are hearing what you're saying, but they're not listening and digesting it. Because, I mean, right now with inflation and everything like that, like, like listening um, to watching some of the um, videos you post on your, on your Twitter and the articles, I mean, when, when the average price of a car in, in one year, you know, raises over $6,000, I mean, that, that, that's something to say. I mean, but and, and let me say this, let me say this, Carla. Carla, let me say this. All of that is a reflection of white folks having all this money. So, what do I mean? So, exactly. basically, there was a chip shortage in cars. Um, as that chip shortage happened, car dealers started making less cars. There's an MSRP on the car. What dealerships started doing is charging more because they had less cars. But you can only charge more if somebody can pay. Well, if there's a pandemic going on, 
people are supposed to have less money and then they they buy less cars so you get stuck with the cars and you charge less for the car as the dealership what's starting to happen is a, a reverse reactionary response where people were willing, willing to pay on on literally like the ford bronco that's like a forty thousand dollar car twenty thousand fifteen thousand dollar markups well what you're seeing is that white folks have so much wealth they have so much wealth that grandparents that parents are in, in are giving these children that are millennial age the wealth to pay whatever the new price is because they just want the car you don't have that so your whole life was predicated on stability that we don't live in no more and i don't know if everybody has to understand it tomorrow or today but they're going to understand it. any last thing you want to say caller well, the only one thing I just want to say is just that, you know, people just need to get honest and um, with, with the situation that they're in and, and to stop believing that, you know, performing these gig jobs is just a, a, a story on your way up the ladder, like a hustle, you know, because it's just not going to happen. Like, the, the only way that we are going to be put back into the game as a, as a community of ADOS is just we need politics, right? Like, like the politics that created our grandparents, we need that for our generation. So that's all I want to say. Man, thank you so much. Everett Binyard thought he was finally in a strong enough financial position to purchase his first home earlier this year. He saved money by living with his parents for a time and secured a higher paying job in 2020. But the 30 year old San Diego corrections officer has struggled to compete in one of the country's hottest real estate markets where the median home price on single family homes reached $860,000. That's in San Diego in July according to the California Association of Realtors. I was just getting outbid, outbid big, Binyard. What Binyard don't understand is you weren't getting outbid. Your family was because what you're seeing is when you talk about homes being that price, that becomes a family investment, multi-generational. We got to see it. We got a 1,000 people in here. We're going to see this to get to about 25,000 uh, eyeballs. Let's make sure that we have this discussion responsibly. So $860,000 house, jumbo loan, you got to put down 10%, if not 15. So you put down $100,000 in a world where black folks ain't got no savings. Where many black folks, as we see in Los Angeles, not that far from San Diego, the middle black family has $200 liquid. See, part of what we're doing is we're running our heads like ramming it against the wall without seeing the wall can i talk about it so you don't want to see the wall but you want to ram your head against it and then get depressed my project is partly to give you the solace to understand the strength of that wall and it's titanium baby so you got this young man who's a correctional officer what they paying you? Fifty-five thousand, seventy thousand. Not tell us about what what he gonna get in the inheritance or, or lean against. You know, hopefully you got a hundred thousand from the parents, eighty-five, fifty, something. What we can't do it no other way. Trying to use labor to compete in a market where people are coming in here multi generationally to buy these eight hundred thousand dollar homes. But what do you expect? They done made you crazy with the Cosby show and Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. So many people watch the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and we come back. I was going to talk about this later, but let me hit it again. I did a whole show on it. But they didn't talk about how the new Fresh Prince of Bel-Air makes no sense. Great caller called in, broke down how the Fresh Prince is actually based on a Dominican man raised in L.A. Remake the reboot of Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Um, we're gonna be talking about this in context of realities of race, racial covenants here in Los Angeles, wealth, comedy, where we're at now, why we need to see a show that's 30 years removed from television. Understand we're in 2022. That show I believe was on the air in the mid to late nineties. Something is going on where there's a psychosis going on amongst black america with black culture where we seem to be stuck in time think about it in 2000 were you really trying to read to a remake of the good times 
Were they really trying to push that? No, they weren't. No, it wasn't their time no more. The Flesh Prince story is actually based on Benny Medina's life story. Come on. Who was Will Smith's, Will Smith's manager. So, you know, Benny Medina was a Dominican teenager that grew up in East Los Angeles. Wait, can you slow that down? Say it again. Uh, can you say it again? What was he? Because I want to make sure. Dominican teenager. Dominican, meaning not Adolf. Right. Go ahead. Adolf. Go ahead. Right. Uh, he grew up in East Los Angeles. Was in foster, in and out of foster care, and a white family. Come on. A wealthy white family. Now it makes of sense. A friend of his. Different strokes. Different strokes. Right. And then also, um, I mean, also he had a relationship with Kerry Gordy, who was Barry Gordy's son. So he, he spent some time over there, but probably not as much, obviously. But that's the basis for the Fresh Prince story. So I, my implication for Hollywood right now is you don't want to hire Adolf's writers, so you run out of original stories. Mm. You run out of stories when you want to tell a black story. You don't have somebody like me or you bringing our life experience into the room. Well, well, if you, well. The thing is, if you re you use real black people, you won't get post stories because we all pull. How the Fresh Prince is actually based on a Dominican man raised in L.A. Wait, that lived in white folks' garage, so it's different strokes. So the show gave us black folks with wings. The show gave us black folks that didn't go through redlining. It gave us black folks that didn't come from slavery while black folks were locked out of that area. So the show became some kind of Lord of the Rings spectacle and then nobody know. It's built on a Dominican man that lived in white folks garage. Now comes the consequence. Can we talk about it? Hold on one second, cause I wanna, I, I, you know, I, I'm just trying to tell y'all that part of the reason this young man is bashing his head against a million dollar home is he was told that a million dollars ain't that much money. All the while, the middle black family in Los Angeles has $200 liquid. Can we talk about it? He didn't say that he a surgeon. He didn't say that he a doctor. He didn't say he's a, a, a lawyer making 350. He said he's a correction officer trying to buy a million dollar house. Locked out and don't even know it. You ever seen somebody locked out of their house trying to pick it with a uh trying to pick the lock with a wooden toothpick? You don't see that. Well, why you see this? Because they don't know because they've been watching the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. They've been watching black folks with wings. They've been made themselves into this powerless, poverty-driven superheroes with no with no advantage. So you can't talk to them because you're talking negative. Talking reality is talking negative. I want to talk today. You got a lot of black folks with a white parent getting their inheritance from a white parent and telling us about what black folks can do. Come on. You got, I'm not talking about what's wrong and right. I'm just telling you what's happening. You got two parents, one of them white. They gave you 75000 You tell other black folks they got two Adolf's parents that you just got to try hard. Come on. It's out there. The opportunity. Y'all remember this article came out a year ago. We're going to revisit it. The mirage of the black middle class. Black Americans have been shut out of stability at every turn. Jasmine, 29, who worked for a nonprofit in Los Angeles, she grew up in the South and attended the same HBCU as her husband, a first-generation college student who now works in STEM. Together, they pull in $192,000. Together, they pull in $192,000, which, according to the Pew Middle Class Calculator, places them among the upper echelon of incomes in the area. But Jasmine believes placing her or anyone else within a particular class is tricky. Come on. I consider anything above the average U.S. salary to be middle class. You just made that up. Can't make up the world, baby. We're going to come back to this article. But before we come back to this article, we're going to use data. Now, wages have been pretty much stagnant since 2010. There's a little bump, but not much. But we're going to use this because the BLS is not giving this out every year as they should because they be hiding the data. Bureau of Labor. But what we know from this Bureau of Labor data is this is the income distribution of black households, not people, households. All of this is important because we're going to get into why your life is so hard in a second. So it's like two, maybe even three people making this money for one house. It could be one person too, don't get me wrong, but it's a lot of 
two and three people. Hmm. So 58%, when you add, add up the numbers, I did the red for you. I added this red so you can do the math easy. 58% of black households make less than $38,000. This rounded up to 40 because of the years that passed. Wages have been stagnant. 77.8% of black households make less than $63,000. But y'all going to all be millionaires. Let's jump down some. Let's jump down some to Jasmine. 98.71% of black households make less than 212. This is where Jasmine would be at. So she in the top 1% of black households. Talking about middle class and all this. The best of black folks is basically lower, lower uh, upper. And then, and then the problem is once you give it away to grandma, mama, and your brother, y'all all just like middle, lower middle. You lower middle again. So what do I what am I saying? If you make 192, you paying 80 to taxes. Let's just roughly say. Um, so you make it, so you bring it in 110. If you give out 50 of that or 40 of that to family, y'all all just lower middle again. Maybe it'll make sense to you later, or maybe it makes sense to you now. I don't know. For example, my husband and I earn middle class salary. She, so she understand again. She called making 192 as a black couple household middle class salaries. Part of this problem is that many laymen have been laying down too long and just talking. She has a salary income for a household for black folks that is among the top 1% of, of black households in the nation. And she's talking about it as middle class because they don't buy nothing without that inheritance. See, it is the icing to that $100,000 to put down on the house. It is the icing to grandmama paying for the tuition for your kids to go to one of these elite LA schools. See, it kick you up, but it can't keep you there. Let me say it again. It kick you up in the air, but it can't keep you there. 310-388-3499. I know we doing... We doing a lesson here. This is a, uh, the Check Biz Show. This is uh, Check Biz Shay Show. This is this is beyond living beyond their means. This is living beyond what you understand what your life means. See, when you black and you making one ninety two, and all your family is lower middle class, you ain't escaped. Because for every dollar you come in, you got to pay 40% to tax. And you might as well say you got to pay another 40% to family tax. For example, my husband and I earn middle class salaries, but we also have significant student debt. Okay, take that out. And often have to support family. Okay, so you got parents that didn't pay for your college. It was their job to pay for your college. That's what America built it like. It was free for them, and now it's time for them to pay for you, and they didn't have it. So you got to pay for yourself and pay for your own college. So you got to pay taxes. Then you got to pay a college tax. I call it a tax because that's what it is. If it was free for them and we got to pay for it now, that's a tax. So you got a double tax. So you got to pay 40% to that. And let's just say you got to pay another 20% on gross. to. So you pay 60% to taxes. Then you got to pay them, your family, for being your family. You just lower middle class. For example, my husband and I earn middle class salaries, but we also have significant student debt and often have to support family. We live in an expensive city, so what seems high in our hometowns is pretty average here. He is saving for retirement, but I haven't even begun. Until very recently, Jasmine's mother lived with them. She tapped out her retirement savings, so Jasmine and her husband helped cover her bills. She must have retired early. Did she ask Jasmine before she retired? Baby. So Jasmine got student loans because the mama couldn't pay probably. But then she went and retired because she ain't want to work no more. But then when she ain't have enough to retire, she came and lived with Jasmine while she got student loans? I need millennials to see it. So Jasmine and her husband helped cover her bills while she got financially secure. I only know of one other couple that has had to navigate that under 30. It ain't one, Jasmine. It ain't one. 
and we will likely have to revisit that living arrangement as she ages. So now the husband got to be tied into it too, because you ain't ready to have that conversation you need to have with your mama. So somebody would say, is her mama supposed to live outside? Is Jasmine supposed to have student loans? We all got questions to answer. It ain't for me to tell you, but just make the math make sense because it's a zero on each side of this ledger. Part of Jasmine and her husband's burden is shared by hundreds of thousands of other millennials and Gen Xers, regardless of race. Regardless of race. See, that's where the game gets played. Hold on. Don't let them play your games with you. White folks have $127 trillion, which means, and understand, 40 to 50 of it is liquid. The mechanisms of college being the price it is, or I worked at the UCLA Financial Aid Office. Fresh out of college, I designed the UCLA eFan system that the whole campus saw, me and my friend Larry. We designed the literal computer programming the way that all of the school, law school, medical school saw their financial aid when it came up, me and him. So two black dudes. So essentially, the reason why I bring that up is I saw the inner workers. White folks is, is paying for college, cash money. So don't let them tell you that everybody going through this. No, what is happening is a stretching where black folks told us to go to college, but didn't say nothing. They wanted us to compete at the top, but didn't know politics for us to have the, 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 the sword and the shield to actually be in that competition. We here now, and, and your mama tapped out her retirement. Hmm. Regardless of race, who have found themselves providing safety nets for their parents, but that need is not evenly distributed across the middle class. In the mid 2000s, 36% of middle class black people, 36% of middle-class black people had a parent living below the poverty line. <clears throat> in the mid-2000s, before the pandemic, before white people took off, 36% of middle-class black people had a parent living below the poverty line. My parents had me at 16, so I got Gen X parents, the oldest Gen Xers. I'm going to tell you right now, that 36 might be 50, 55 now. Because a lot of y'all, my contemporaries, y'all parents were true boomers and they were professionals. That's why how you became a lawyer. So you don't know shit about what everybody behind, like really dealing with in the, in the heart of it. <clears throat> what I tell you being first, meaning because I was my age and then my parents were like the oldest Gen Xers, if they didn't get good pensions and they didn't make money like, like the youngest boomers or the middle boomers, that group has gotten older. You might fuck around and somebody had to deal with their mama being homeless and that's a that's a whole shit to deal with seeing your mama on the corner but in the mid 2000s 36 percent of middle class black people had a parent living below the poverty line as opposed to only eight percent of the white middle class <clears throat> according to one 2006 study black middle class americans are 2.6 times more likely to have a low income sibling than those in the white middle class People like Jasmine have a higher probability of becoming the primary source for the reservoir of stability, essentially becoming government. I just described that for their extended family, which in turn makes it more difficult to save or invest or set up the financial infrastructure that will ensure that you won't need help from your children later in life. No, 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 no. They're not telling you the whole truth. They telling you here, you ain't finna have no future. Because the future is getting more expensive, not less. There's been no politics. Used cars are up. We'll talk about that. Rent is up. And you out here got to be government so your mama don't end up homeless. Because she done uh, uh, tapped out her retirement. Can we talk about it? We got Keisha in the same article. So this is the same article. The Mirage of the Black Middle Class, 310-388-3499, call in. I know a lot of y'all just listening. Let me make sure to check in. Can I, can I check in and see what you guys are seeing? Let me see what everybody is saying. Got to work till 76, 67. Woo, me, press light. I know a lot of people are shocked. 
A lot of y'all looking like you ever seen one of them pork, uh, one of them uh, possums when he come out at night. You ever seen what a possum do when you look at it like hard at night and they see you look, it just freeze up. I see a lot of y'all looking like that. 310-388-3499. Yeah, gas is six five dollars. Just be prepared to pay seven. Don't be laughing, ain't no way. You know you looking like a possum. I see you over there. Um Keisha, who's 33 and lives in Atlanta with her husband, expressed some, something similar. As an understand, Keisha is expressing something similar. They said it's hundreds of thousands of uh of people in the article, but Jasmine told us. She the only one. Part of the ADOS project is to bring y'all together to see, no, this is a national norm for black folks. So you the only one because you done put yourself around a bunch of boomer hook people and you ain't boomer hook. Get it? You done surrounded yourself with foil. And when I poke a hole through it, you blame me. Take the damn foil off. Can we talk about it? So I can get you to do some politics. Running around here in a hurricane with full on talking about you good. My 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 friend, all my friends, all my, all, all, all my friends is good, but you got full on. God damn Jasmine. Keisha, who's 33 and lives in Atlanta with her husband, expressed something similar. As an IT specialist, in the transportation field, she makes around $95,000, and her husband brings in $50,000. She was the first person in her family to go to college that currently pays $450 a month in student loan debt. The other big monthly payments in their lives are is the $2,000 mortgage and $1,500 towards paying down their credit card debt. They're saving very little very month every month, usually somewhere between $50 and $100. In many ways, Keisha thinks her situation is similar to her parents. Growing up, her family was always comfortable, but with the feeling that if income stops, then that would change very quickly. Let's go back. I need people to stop living on feelings, start living on reality. You be too far along for you not to know this chart. You ain't nothing like your parents. You mean these people that lived during this part where all this wealth was being shared? You ever wonder why people be having two families, two whole families? You know, you know what I'm saying? Out here, out here is a mechanic or something with a whole second family, and you done made sure both refrigerators full, pulled up. Because they're living there in this part. You live over here. You got to talk about, damn it, somebody that was right out of slavery or right after that. I get why my life similar to somebody, uh, you know, 40 years, 50, 100, uh, 50 years removed from slavery. Stop telling me about your parents. In many ways, Keisha thinks her situation is similar to her parents. Growing up, her family was always comfortable, but with the feeling that income stops, then that would change very quickly. The difference, Keisha says, is that her parents had a much larger support network. No, that's not the difference, Keisha, baby. Baby, that ain't the difference. This is the difference. Your parents were competing against a white world that only had $24 trillion. So they can only rise prices so much. In a world that still had affirmative action, that recognized ADOS, that in a world that didn't have a, as many black immigrants. So only ADOS were here, and if you came here, you had to fold into ADOS. Your world is $127 trillion. Black immigrants dominate access to privilege and, and, and advantage. Your world is one where it requires inheritance. Their world is one where they made it for the next generation or didn't and just spent it up on their second family or whatever they did. Let's talk about it. Whatever they did, you know, going out, trips, all kind of stuff. The difference, she says, that her parents had a much larger support network and that they were making less money. Hmm. You're making, they're making less money when people make less money. Uh, I just, it's just almost like, you really, really? It was understandable for them. They're making less money. They don't have no student debt. In fact, shit, they didn't go to college. I think it said first gen, right? Oh, the other one definitely did. Was the first person in her family to go to college. She went to college and is comparing herself to people who graduated from high school in the like 70s or late 60s. Your life should look nothing like theirs. It should be a hundred times better. That's what politics should have did for you. 
but you done made a forgiveness that the world ain't gave you. It was understandable for them to need help occasionally as opposed to myself and my spouse who don't have children and make higher salaries. I feel like people in my situation are held to a different standard. There's no room to mess up, to room for catastrophe. It's hard to knit your own social safety net. I honestly don't know what she's talking about, but I do know that when we look at this, you can see it expressed here. So this is the income distribution of all black households, 2010 to 2012. I'll tell you again, wages have largely stagnated, but there's a slight boost. But just looking at this distribution, this is households. The expression of, it, of this chart, 58% of black households make less than $38,000. That's this line and this line. Ugh. How many of y'all know what, in the chat, how many of y'all know what $38,000 look like in a check or $40,000 for a whole household in a check. I think if we if we put it out in a check, $1,000 every two weeks, everybody money together. So one person made $400 this week and another person made $300 and another person made $300. So it's $1,000 that came in. Can we talk about it? A lot of people out here. They just talking, but they don't look at the numbers. But look how it, it's tear down. It, it dropped after $100,000. In fact, let's go back and find out how many black households, because y'all use this number, $100,000, make more than five, about 5%. About 5% make more than $100,000, which isn't, but. Without inheritance, strong working class in America. For a household, strong working class. Strong middle class. Only 5% of black households. I understand you'll say it was 2012. It ain't changed that much. They ain't gave us, it's been stagnant, the wages. 310-388-3499 is a call in. I want to hear from you. I know everybody just shook up. Well, y'all shook up? Tell me if y'all shook up. Woo wee. But let's get into this article. We got 1,200 people in here. I know everybody's listening. She said, I'm sorry, 30K with a family. That's not good. That's a black family. Wait, wait, wait. I agree with you. It ain't good. Oh, 58% of black families make less than $38,000. BLS, Bureau of Labor Data. This ain't my data. Tell them to show us again. They be hiding the data. They don't want us to know and get frustrated. But let's share this article. Let's share some of this article. Charles Bryant, this is a, a, a article. Meet a millennial who's turning 40, starting yet another new career and has $47,000 in debt. I've worked very hard and it didn't pay off. It feels very unfair. Charles Bryant is turning 40 next month. But in some ways, his career path feels like he's just graduating high school again. And he's nowhere near where he expected to be at this point in his life. So he's, a, as I understand it, college dropout, graduated from high school, starting a new career because of the pandemic. A New York native now living in Delaware, Bryant was working as a hotel manager when the pandemic shut down operations. He had to furlough 36 out of uh, the hotel's 40 employees. So he worked in hotel services. He was basically a high school graduate working in the hotel services. And the property turned into a temporary homeless shelter during the pandemic. After taking a pay cut for a while, he eventually left. The pandemic halted all the positive momentum I had built professionally in since 10 years prior. I feel for this, man, but I would say it isn't the pandemic because we were telling you for a long time, well before the pandemic, probably 10 years before the pandemic, you're going to get halted. Somehow there was a belief that you were safe. But I don't see the retirement or the pension or the $350,000 saved up that made it okay for you to feel safe. And so now I see a lot of black folks struggling. Living with his parents and living off of savings 
and stimulus checks, Bryant continued to look around for opportunities. He even got a real estate license, but the leads were slow, so he couldn't sell no property. Ah. Meet a millennial who is turning 40, starting yet another. Come on. Let me shrink this so you can see it. Career and has $47,000 in debt. Let me share a little more of that article. But the struggle over the last two, two decades to eke out a career has taken its toll. I was one of those guys that had a five-year, a 10-year plan. I wanted to be a certain place. Brian says everyone, he says, dreams of growing up and owning a home with two and a half kids and a dog. The reality of being divorced and living with his parents is troubling. So he got married, he got divorced. I follow the rules that they gave us. Who is they? Let's be talking about his parents. I played the game and went to school. Now let's go back because a lot of y'all is out here following rules. You following rules for the Negro Leagues. They playing Major League Baseball now. Somebody gave you rules for this point, this part right here, 1963. But you live right here. How about you go try to find out the rules for the depression? It'd be some different rules, some different expectations. Because that's what you living in, bro. You listening to people giving you rules for the wrong time period. Can we talk about it? I followed the rules they gave us. I played the game and went to school, and I did very well. You did not finish school. Every job I've worked, I've worked very hard, and it didn't pay off. This whole period of uncertainty over the past couple of years just kind of been icing on a really bad cake. It's been tough, Brian says. After graduating high school in 2000, Brian attended University of North Carolina at Greensboro, but left school before graduating. One of the things I am seeing amongst Black America is a strong anti-academic like sense while you send your kids to school. You know, I ain't going, my kids ain't going to college. That's the answer. In a world that requires an advanced college degree to get a, a, a higher end salary, and, and you're not going to leave no inheritance, and you're not leaving a business, so what they going to do? What is this magic that you got? Please do tell us. Do tell. You got this young man who dropped out of college who's a high school graduate. Talking about he followed the rules. You didn't. You didn't finish college. Now, I'm not saying college is an end all to save you. But what I am saying is we have entered a world where college is required. The question becomes, is your parents going to pay and are you going to go? And if you're not going to go and your parents are not going to pay, are we going to the army or what are we going to do? What are we going to do here? Because we don't need no more hotel managers and we don't need retail managers because all of that is unstable. Can I talk? Now, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I believe there should be a world where college is not required. I believe there should be a world where college is free. But in that world, you got to have some immigration policy. But y'all want to have no immigration policy, too. You kind of just live in just random. Can we talk? Just saying stuff. Unfortunately, Brian's experience is not atypical. In 2010, during the uh, height of the Great Recession, 17.2% of those aged 20 to 24 were out of work. That is collapse. So if it's 17.2% overall, it's probably like 40% for blacks. That unemployment had long-term consequences with the Center of American Progress estimating that those younger workers lost out on $21 billion in wages over the next 10 years. Millennial wages continue to stagnate for years, and after that, even once employment rates recovered. In fact, millennials earn about 20% less than baby boomers did at the same age. See, you can't say this about income, make less money, and not know how to count. That inflation, that context of, of housing prices, that whole set of policies. Next time you count your salary, take out your student loans and take it out gross. Let me say it again. If you're out there, you're making $75,000 and you pay $500 a month on your student loans. 
let's do the math. Follow me. Watch this. You out there, you're making seventy five thousand, eighty thousand dollars. You pay five hundred dollars on your student loans at six thousand dollars. I want you to take the seventy thousand dollars, take out your taxes. So you're taking home about forty five thousand dollars. Take out for six thousand dollars before you start counting what you done made, because that's another tax that your parents didn't have to pay. I want to talk about it because it seems like everybody's struggling. Three one zero three eight eight three four nine nine. People scared of the chat today. I notice everybody's scared. It's okay if you don't feel like calling because it's a heavy ass show. I got thirteen hundred people in here. Somebody said, and, and we still get hired. The lowest rate, regardless of degree. You're absolutely right. And part of that is because can't nobody make no goddamn calls for you. And another part of you didn't know politics to make sure that through affirmative action, through policy, you go first. Like, because ADOS is a checkbox and you go first. There was no policy set up that way. So, yeah, but it's still required to have a degree to get a good salary. It's, it showed it in the article that I showed. That's America now. So I wish it was different, but what you can't tell me is your kids ain't going to college, they're going to start a business, and you ain't got no money. That's going to be the answer. Woo, we in here. We in here. Slow it down. I followed the rules that they gave us. I played the game and went to school. And I did very well. Every job I've worked, I've worked very hard, and it didn't pay off. It feels very unfair. Princess, call in. Give me something on this. I know you got something to say. Oh, man. Everybody is shook up. But I'm going to shake you up some more. The context of our lives is this. More than half, this is an article came up today. Shout out to the Philly Tribune. More than half of unemployed men in their 30s have criminal histories. Now, you can say they shouldn't do crimes or anything else, but everybody do crimes, but not everybody go to jail or get a charge. When you look at incarceration rates, and I did this chart some years ago on the GRIO, what you saw is that young black men were at 9,000 per 100,000. One of the, to give you a metric, one of the highest incarceration rates we've ever seen in the modern world was South Africa during apartheid. And they were at, black men were at 800 per 100,000, which is 0.8. Black women are at 332, not because they do that much less crimes. It's just they just don't have the jails and they say, you don't, when you do it, you let you out. Give you probation, whatever. Huh? Don't charge you at all. White women are at 129. So these black men are being set up in a way where their lives are collapsed before it gets started. More than half of unemployed men in their 30s have criminal histories. I need you guys to see it. Somebody says, stay out of the Versace and Gucci shops. Maybe you'd have some money saved. Yeah, that's not black people's problem. It's just levels to our conversation. We'll come back to here. Uh, well, actually, I'll start here because she must have came in late. Um, excuse me, miss. Uh, wages have largely stagnated, so BLS and also government refuses to release this regularly, but wages have been stagnant. You can go look it up. But 58% of blacks make less than 30, black households, not people, make less than $38,000. Actually, let me pull that up because I want to make sure we don't lose her. I don't want to lose her. How many of y'all, can y'all point me in her direction? I might not be able to find her again. Hold on, because we're not going to lose her. She says, stay out of the Versace shop. Where's she at? Damn, I can't find her again. I got to find her. Damn, say it again. Say, stay out of the Versace shop again, because I want you to. Well, I want to hit you. I, hold on. Y'all going to have to be paused, because I love that. I like it when people bring that hammer. Did she she ain't removed the comment. I don't know if she did. She ain't running like that. There she go. Let's lead that up. 
Stay out of them Versace and Gucci shops. Maybe you'd have some money, say. All right. That's what she said. That's what she said. 77% of black households, one, two, three people earning money, make less than $63,000. We live in a world where white folks went from that two trillion dollars in 1980 over the course of a single lifetime they have 127 trillion dollars black folks have seven half of it is pension working age black people live check to check paying off student loans and what your answer is stay out of the versace and gucci shops next time you get a chance go in the versace and gucci shop and take a picture and show me how many black folks you see not just like counting yourself or on a on a random Tuesday. Not saying they don't go, but I don't think that's their main audience. We make up a lot of stuff. We make a lot of stuff up. We say a lot of stuff. It's the wrong channel. Maybe you need to go find one of them relationship channels or something else because we doing data here. We don't do that bullshit. Ah. Let's talk about it. So let's get into the consequences. Rents have exploded across the country, causing many to fall behind on payments, dig deeper into their savings or downsize to subpar units. And nowhere was a jump bigger than in Miami metro area, where the median rent exploded to $2,800, $2,850 to be exact, 50% higher. Year over year. Jesus. Somebody put this up, Boxiana. This is a house that was rented in Atlanta. Look at the requirements, baby. Woo-wee! What you would need to submit with the application. You need a 640. You need to be on your job two years, 24, 24 months. You need a copy of a valid driver's license. I need everybody as a as an attorney, criminal defense attorney, how important valid is in that word. Because that means all your tickets and all that got to be clear, your warrants, your child support. Hold on. What they doing? They, they they must be hiring for for somebody to be a, a high level job. No, this is a for a rental. Hold on. Copy of social security card. Copy of your three months of pay stubs. Pay months pay stubs must show you bring home at least six thousand dollars a month. Oh my God! What is this? Is this accurate? You got to bring six thousand dollars a month just to rent. Copy of your 2020 and 2021 10W 1040 or 1099. To move in on the first, you will need 2200 dollars for the first month and 2200 dollars for the security deposit. Total move in is 6600 dollars This is what we're dealing with. We live in this world and we got somebody talking about Versace. No, no, our problem right now is that we ate off and didn't nobody do no reparations or no politics. Didn't nobody do no reparations, no politics. How many people got how many people out there got all the stuff on this list? You mean don't tell me you barely got sixty six hundred dollars. I'm gonna say that fifteen thousand, which is really how many people got all the stuff on this list? It's a big old list. How many of y'all been on your job 24 months? Valid license. Pay stuff showing you bring home at least $6,000 a month. Uh, it's a lot. This is America. Somebody cleared it up and said, so-and-so, this is not rental for an apartment. But a house in Riverdale, Georgia, three bedroom, two bath, appliances included. So they want you to pay their mortgage. They try to have you pay their mortgage. Come on. Come on. Come on. I said, thanks. This is very helpful. You made that clear. But I will say, in that market, rented homes are operating like apartments. Let's read that number two. This has contributed to a housing problem in growing cities in America, such as Atlanta, where BlackRock, an investment group, has bought nearly 12,000 homes. So they buy all the homes, and then they rent them out. They rent them out, and they give you a list. If you ain't got the list, you can't live there. $6,000. We know that the middle black family is worth about $2,000. 
has nearly no liquid wealth. In Miami, I think the Color of Wealth report show is a middle native black family had like, uh, what was it, $100? No, I think it was $11 liquid. In Boston, it was eight. In, in LA, yeah, it was 11 in Miami. It was eight in Boston. I'm talking, this is a liquid wealth. And in Los Angeles, they had $200 liquid. So we just making up numbers now. Many are dealing with the consequence of living in red states without rent protections while lauding the cheap housing of red states. See, for a long time being in Los Angeles, these rents were our rents. So everybody just kind of blamed. Again, we love to allow self-blame instead of dealing with it should look this way. And they say, you should just live, move in Atlanta. It's your fault. You should move in Atlanta. You should be in Atlanta. Well, now Atlanta is high. The only difference is that Atlanta is a red state. Now, I'm not saying rent control is everywhere. We got rent control in L.A. County. I'm just telling you that. we They can go up 3% every year. That's it. But Oregon, the whole state got rent control. But what I am saying is you combine the rents with the unemployment issues we saw in Florida, with the lack of services, uh, with you combine the rents with the retraction of small small government, with Texas and how you bid on energy, then you end up in this place where you see an America that has basically built itself for a stable person, for a person that will receive wealth. Can we talk about it? Can we talk about it? I need you to see it. Many are dealing with the consequence of living in red states. Thank you so much. I got a whole, I got a whole lot of people who got opinions. I want to give people a chance to get in here. Caller, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey, Joe. This is Jay from South Florida. What's up, Jay? Jay, everybody in the chat. I see a lot of people in the chat. And what's weird about this moment is I come back to this chart. And I, it's important because the last time the bottom 90 had the same amount of wealth was a depression. It feels like a lot of people can't really understand the consequence of blackness until it's right on them. And or the consequence of mass inequity. So I'm hearing people talk like they stable, but they don't know that this you ain't stable. Not only because you not stable, but because your parents and your cousin and your brother ain't stable. What you think? I, I agree. Actually, I called it to, to share a story that I had. It, it, it's um, my wife and I went on a trip. We visited our family uh, in another state. We, we, we kind of talked to uh, our mother, my mother-in-law, about the the same thing we, you talk about on the show. And she argued with us, telling us that you know we need to, you know, kind of like what you see in the, in the uh, chat where the guy was saying we need uh, the financial literacy, we need to work hard, and if if, if we did that, then we would be, you know, like in her position where she feels like she worked hard and she made it. And then a couple weeks later, you know, she's in her 60s. She called, she called and she needs help to pay her bill. And the reason why I called into that story because it, I think it illustrates the disconnect that people have where they are in situations that the economic deprivation is so severe and they, and they can't see it. They literally cannot see it. Yeah, they can't see it. And, and then when you tell them, they get frustrated with you when you try to explain to them the dynamics of how wealth actually works now. And so, like, in a lot of ways, I don't, like, literally, I feel like if you got a kid that's, like, in college or, like, let's say, like, 15, if you ain't got 100000 for them to, like, be able to use throughout college, it's tough because you just sending them off there into the wild, wild west. And like that's like low end, but you're not supposed to have it by yourself. Children, elite children, are now uh, raised by a web of people, so it matters that you don't know your daddy and he in prison exponentially more than ever before. And it matters that your mama is selfish and just be buying bags or anything. And it matters that your grandparents really just didn't think about you at all, because without them doing their part, your part really don't matter as much as you think it does. Come on. Any last thing you want to say? Uh, yeah. Yes, I, I think that people need to realize that every generation is built upon the generations that came before it. And if the generations that came before it were wealthy and 
say not just that, but like you say all the time, the fact that the share of wealth in the top percentage is like it used to, if, if the potion what it was back during the Great Depression, you know, that's like telling, that's like when you look at something like that, that's like telling people in the Great Depression, they need to pull themselves up by the bootstraps. Can I say one more thing they, to your okay? But one thing I want to add They had to pass laws and, and create the, the government made jobs for those people so they can get themselves out of that poverty. Can I add one more thing to your point, though? I do want everybody to understand something is going on here. Something is going on. I'm going I'm to let you go and say it offline. Um, something is going on here. The young, the, the brother said, um, said, every generation builds on this on the prior. What happened, though, is that your, your, your parents, if they like 65, they parents didn't have nothing. It was a depression. They got all this wealth in the middle of a, a moment where America was trying to make people successful and middle class. We don't live then, but we, whoever you are, whether it happened for you or not, I understand Adolf's oppression, but contextually what this moment is about is a reflective lens. What do I mean? Let me slow it down because I, I want to make sure. Your success today is a reflection of what somebody here did to make you successful because of how they set it all up. So their success was not predicated on this on their family here. It was just predicated on their own work product. Them going to work at a factory job, meet somebody at the factory and tell them about a program, and then going to buy a house. Your success is not about you going to college as much as, much as it is. Did they do that work and then leave you the house so that while we have this downturn, it's like a squirrel. There's summertime and then there's wintertime. There's a time, to, follow me, there's a time to go get walnuts and there's a time to be in that little burrow. What I'm saying to you is effectively, we in the burrow time, trying to go get walnuts like it's summer. You needed your grandmama to get the walnuts and America don't care if she didn't. Now, if you out in the winter, which a lot of ADOS are, trying to get walnuts, the last thing you can do if you find one that's a frozen half a piece of walnut is get back to the burrow and give it to your grandma. Come on. Now, I'm not saying you got to deal with that question, how you deal with it. But I'm just telling you, this was the moment. 70, 78, 83. What isn't the moment is 2022. What ADOS is saying is we believe, and I believe that, John Yarmuth, the person who co-wrote the CARES Act, came to the ADOS conference for a reason, that he was heat checking. I could have, Yvette could have, ADOS Foundation could have pushed for you to get reparations, but instead you want to play on the internet and watch God knows what you fucking watch. Instead, you want to march with a Black Lives Matter shirt, but not ask about the donations. It's okay, though. There is a tomorrow, and that tomorrow is your today. Can we talk about it? We got a full queue. Caller, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey, John. Can you hear me? I hear you. Hi, it's um, Trisha. Okay, it's Trisha. So I have something to call. I read the article, the entire article. And one thing I want to say about Black Millennials is it's a high cost of being broke right now for us. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it, it's a high cost of being broke for a group that doesn't have any money. One of the one of the things that cost him up is starting a family, as you always talked about. In the article, he mentioned that he's 40 years old, just turned 40, that he um, lived with his parents, so he's newly divorced, he doesn't have any kids. So if he, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, with all his financial debt, with everything that's, you know, going on with the low income, it's now costing us, like, our families, unlike our white counterparts, who are starting families very young, popping out two or three kids just to go ahead and get it out the way, to go to mommy and daddy, and all of that. I wanted to shine light. I'm a millennial. I'm, I'm under 35 mm. years of age. I work for a Fortune 500 company in senior leadership, dealing with cybersecurity and data protection. Come on. I have a senior leadership title. I make $166,000 a year. Mm -hmm. um, I'm one of those unicorns that you get talked about. I make $166,000 a year. I live in Atlanta. I'm fully 100% remote. 
I get a 20% annual bonus increase I uh, of my salary. So 20% at the end of the year, I get it of my salary. I get a grant for stock. So every year, my company gives me, gives me money that I can either buy out or sell for a stock grant based on my senior level position. Derek Holmes wants to know if you're married. It's going to take there's people in the chat already trying to engage. <laughs> Somebody trying to get engaged. Oh, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, Derek, you Derek, leave her alone. She ain't trying to deal with nobody like you. I know you. No, I'm just messing with you. Go ahead. It's about right. So so what what I wanted to say that is for anyone, if you guys don't understand the, the plight of black America and where we are, especially millennials going forward, we I would have to work. What I'm doing right now, that I've been doing for two years, I have to do it for two years just to start to, to dig myself, dig myself out of what, you know, what pretty much America has replaced us in from a, from a uh, money perspective when it comes to black America. Well, let, let me, let me, let me say this. Let me say this. All my let me jump in here. There's two, there's two sides to the, there's two issues that confront black people, especially if they're first gen access to this kind of wealth is in this moment more than any other that wealth is supposed to be attached and plugged into other wealth so what you see exactly. is that wealth cuz it cuz you no know, income is is taxed so high 40% 35% that wealth is supposed to signal to your 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 parents and your grandparents you are now ready for the wealth that they supposed to be saving for you it's just the moment we in <laughs> and so now the second thing exactly. is the second thing is, once as a black person you make that well, far too often you got to give it away to people that were supposed to save for you. And now you are serving the function of government in the middle of an America that is basically saying it that that it's time to inherit. And I, I think that what we don't understand is far a lot of people because what you're describing. Let's let's look at that salary. Is a salary in the one hundred eighty thousand dollar range. That's in the top one percent, one and a half percent of black households, not people. What happens is that a lot of people like you are going to get scared off from being around the rest of the black family because you can't. Because what they're doing, they're stretching it too thin. Where your very presence is your own stability. Instability. Now, I'm not advocating for it, but what I am saying is that without a body of politics to sit that kind of wealth income into. It becomes a very hard thing to be around other people that are basically struggling to eat. But I'll, I'll let you say one last thing. Go ahead. Um, you you hear the dead on the head, and I don't know. I don't know if the caller caught it right before you started talking. I was literally saying that I literally kind of take care of my entire family. That's who that's who they call when they need anything, right? So, and I'm not talking about one or two. I'm talking about five to ten, right? Whenever they need anything, so that's one. No wealth, money, or anything. Put it any type of provision by my grandmother, mother, anyone like that. So let's just go. Let's just start that off. The second thing is, I literally was just telling my husband. <laughs> and she married, y'all. Leave that lady alone. Leave that lady alone. That ain't what my my chat is for. Macking and all that. Go ahead. I'm I'm just messing with you. in America, especially when it comes to finances, we are not, you know, equally yoked in that perspective. So I was telling my husband that, and I was literally crying about it the other day, I said, you know, everybody I talk to, I say in the area of like my work, etc., tells me that I need, no matter what color he is, I may need to find someone on a higher income level, which you know what we yeah, wait, 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 wait. So their answer, who is everyone? Hold on. Let's 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 do a little relationship. You married and they telling you okay. <laughs> as a married woman, you need yes. to find some. Hold on. Yes. So instead of black people doing no, politics. No, 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 no. Go ahead. Listen, 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 let me let me let me tell you what I mean. It's not it's not like it's not like you have like normal conversations. So when I say telling me, I don't mean like directly, but what they're saying is in a normal, just regular conversation, they're saying, oh, in order to dig your way out of debt, you're going to pretty much need someone. But we ain't off. Why I got to do all that? Why I got to do all that? I'm ain't off. Right, give, me, right. give me my reparations. I ain't got to do all that. Give me my, my, my advantage. Fix this immigration policy. Do all of these things. See, y'all thought right. this was abstract. You can't have your ADOS husband 
if you don't fix this immigration policy because it, it all attaches. You can't have your life if you don't fix this this policy that deals with reparations because your grandmama ain't leaving you no inheritance. You have to deal with the reality of a political shift. So young black people, instead of talking about politics, are talking about running from other young black folks. Yep. Any last thing you want to say? Yep. You're, you hit a date on the head, and that's what I was saying. I was crying him about the other day. It's like when you're having normal conversations with people, not knowing exactly your situation. They aren't saying things like, oh, girl, you're going to have to get someone making 160 or better. I don't care what color he is, Asian, white, or whatever, to dig yourself out of, you know, whatever date you feel to quicker. No matter, you know what I'm saying? No matter, you know, not knowing your situation. So everything you said is exactly what you get it all on the head. I have nothing else to say, but I just wanted to kind of shine light on I'm actually a unicorn, and I'm making that amount of money. My company is giving me the stock. They're giving me the twenty percent annual bonus. And looking at it and sitting down and seeing, you know, financially, digging myself out of the past debt, student loans and everything, it'll take a couple of years, and it's just not like that for our white counterparts. But the other thing that's going to happen, let me see, and I see it already, is that our relationships become highly transactional. Shout out to Zoe Williams. Mm -hmm. Because what happens is, mm -hmm. is understand this, follow me, and I don't know your situation. So your husband's supposed to take the role of your, of your daddy. Don't nobody talk about whether your daddy had money, but they're going to talk about your husband pulling you out of it. Oh, no, no, I'm just saying, praise with me. So I'm not blaming your daddy because I don't know him. But let's say a young black lady who has a daddy that was incarcerated. Everybody wants to talk about a husband, but nobody wants to talk about the daddy and the reason that we have a mechanized system that made sure your life was going to be hard. I said to you earlier, let's go back to it, that your life today, and I'm pulling the chart up again, is a reflection of what happened in this moment, this 80s, this 90s. So whatever that is, that is your truth. Now the question becomes, what kind of politics you gonna do to change that truth? I'm gonna let you go. Right. I got a lot of people in the queue. Right. I appreciate everybody calling in. Man, that was a good call. Y'all leave that sister alone, she married. Both sides. The young men stop asking her for a date, get you a job. And the young women stop telling her she gotta date somebody else. To, she got a husband. They need to build their life together. Golly, we got some off. Blacks and red states will be uh, waking to a whole different, in a whole different way. We got this article, red. So I, that connects, this article is going to connect. I know it's a white woman, but black folks is dealing with the brunt of it. I believe the next five years will be tough for us all, but for blacks and red states, it will be a whole awakening to blackness in a whole different way. So we got this move down to Atlanta. You know, move to Atlanta because the house is cheap. Get down there, move to Florida. Get down there, they ain't got no unemployment processing. Some states, Texas, Mississippi, Arkansas, and Nebraska, denied about 90% of welfare applicants in 2020. Texas, where a single parent of two must earn less than $188 a month, had the lowest acceptance rate at just 7%, but had $281 million in unspent welfare funds. I'm just telling you the way this goes. Red state, red law. Y'all ready for it? I'm going to talk about this used car thing. You knew used car prices were high. Here's how outrageous it has become. Let me bring another caller in. Caller, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Hi. Um, I'm a boomer, a tail end boomer, mm. and I appreciate everything, you, all your data you put out and all every, all your discussions. I have a daughter who just graduated college, and she, we were fortunate because she had a full scholarship. And just to bring a point home that you were talking about is one of the um, – White kids who was in school with her was um, they were all just sitting around talking, and she was waiting for all her scholarship money and everything to be applied. And this this kid, this white boy, was saying, "Yeah, you know, I I still owe fees and blah 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 blah." And he just straight out told them, "He's like, yeah, I'm waiting on my grandmother to send a check. I'm waiting on my grandmother to send a check for my fees." Basically, I had told my daughter, I said, "What's going to happen is," I said. The grandmother is giving her wealth or her money to her grandchild to pay for his education so his parents can do whatever they're going to do with their money. I said, and in the end, he's going to probably still get some money from his grandmother. And it turns out, she talked to him a little bit more, turns out his grandfather was some big-time businessman or whatever and had a whole bunch of stock in the company he worked in. And that's what they were sending him to school with. 
Yeah, I, I got an article here right about from Forbes. I don't know if you follow my Twitter, but there was an article in Forbes. I do. Millennials are banking on the great wealth transfer. Four words why you shouldn't cash that check yet. But, but in this article, they talk about how the grandparents, <laughs> follow me, is treating the grandchildren like they actual children. What that does is it yeah. inflates yeah. the market. So let me go back. Before I go forward, we're going to go back. What I was trying to say to y'all earlier about this chart and this one is when you look, your parents were competing against a whole country where working class people, didn't have, their parents didn't have nothing. Rich people might have had some, a few, but like working. And so like there was no grandparents like infusing large amounts of capital that, that let your labor, your parents' labor had to compete against. Your world is entirely different. You are being told to go to, and also their parents weren't telling them to go, and black people weren't allowed to in many cases, go to Ivy's and go to UCLA. Now your parents told you to go off and go to the elite school, save no money, and you now compete against people who are getting massive transfers. Now, the, the thing that I'm the thing that's happening now is there's even infighting amongst white folks. Maybe millennials and business alike may not want to cash that check just yet. The money might just might just pass them by. Four words, I love my grandchildren, exclaimed the 60-something-year-old woman, glowing nearly as brightly as her phone screen, displaying two smiling, admittedly cute kids. So what you see is that child, grandchildren, the setting was Actually, let me read this. Apparently, they're not alone. Reports abound of parents skipping their adult children in their wealth transfer plans. Reasons vary. Boomers have record high divorce rates, adding complexity to relationships with adult children, complicating wealth transfer plans, and often producing unplanned costs. For some, skipping is retribution for adult children deemed as undeserving. So they're skipping them and giving it to what can I do for my grandkids, creating an inflation. Yeah. So when you see the prices of college, when you see the price of tuition, when you see the price of daycare, those are not abstract. White folks is paying with this $127 trillion. Obama, Trump, Biden, they make your life hard. Give the white folks all this money. Go ahead, I'll let you say one last thing. Oh, really quickly, I, that, I told my daughter, I said, this is what I've been trying to drill into your head for the longest, because we live in PC County, the most delusional group of black folks. Other than Ladera. And what I'm trying to <laughs> I'm sorry. I said other than Ladera Heights here in LA, that's the other one. PG yeah, County, Ladera yeah. Heights. Yeah. And I was trying to tell her, I said, we aren't rich. I said, your grandparents aren't rich. I said, your grandparents just happened to be in the right place at the right time, and they were able to take advantage of a lot of problems, and that's why they're able to have what they have. I said, but compared to white people, we, we're doing, your grandparents are doing good, but they're not doing like what they should have been doing if everything had been fair. I said, they just were in the right spot at the right time. And when she went through college and she saw how the white kids' grandparents were, she had to come back and say, oh, grandma and granddad weren't as rich as I thought. I'm like, they were never rich. I said, they were just able to do, well, you know, do live a good life. And as you say, they were government. My, my mother and father were government in some cases for other family members. Um, and, and so were my uncles. They were also government because... There was, you know, as you say, everybody doesn't, you know, move forward, progress the right way. So they, they, my parents helped a lot of relatives. My uncles helped a lot of relatives because they just needed that help. You know, food, shelter, sometimes funerals, things like that. So my daughter, God bless her, she's 23 now. She sees what I have been trying to tell her. And she started watching your show, too. So Thank everything you. that I've been telling her, I guess coming from you because you're younger, it kind of hits hits her home now, and I want to thank you for that. It, it, and it let me and let me say something else that happened for a lot of middle aged, well, older millennials and younger Gen Xers is we were indoctrinated. Again, I told you guys go watch the Century of Self, and you'll find out how they learn to use consumption to control like the middle class. But no group was more targeted, I believe, in the late eighties and the nineties than black folk. And so, like, you have yeah. this visual of black success and access that never happened. So, literally, here in Los Angeles, black folks were red lines out of buying homes up there in Bel Air for a long time. The best black homes was Ladera, and uh, and and um, I've talked about it before. Why they don't fix those up? 
the uh, rules in 78 and everything, property tax, how, how it affects him. But like you have this, this story put on TV, built out of what we factually know, I'm not guessing, a Dominican man that went and lived in white people's garage. And what the producer said is we just going to make them black. What they're saying is we're going to forget slavery. What they're saying is we're going to forget Jim Crow. What they're saying is we don't care about the consequence that has on everybody from your daughter to everyone else's daughter and how they won't be able to understand race and wealth. See, if this family was different strokes, yeah. we would be, I think that further along. Now somebody would say, uh, ain't it good to see a black family? No, not if it didn't happen. It's actually bad, awful. Because you get this idea that if I become a lawyer or a judge, I will have access to that too. But nobody did any politics for you to have access. I'm going to leave it at that. Let me take a few more callers. Thank you so much for calling in. Thank you. Thanks. Woo-wee. Look, I, 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 before I take another call, because I'm going to take a couple more callers, because everybody's been waiting on the line. Apologize I didn't get to you guys earlier. You knew used car prices were high. Here's how outrageous it, here's how outrageous it has become. The average used car sold for nearly $30,000 in January, 30% hike from two years ago. You got people that bought a car with 15,000 miles in 2017, drove it to 35,000 miles, and then sold it back to the dealership for 5,000 more than they bought it for. That's what's going on in America. Somebody would say, well, that, 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 that sounds like a good investment. It sounds like economic chaos. Cars are depreciating assets. And the last people that can survive economic chaos are people without a window a window to fall out of or a pot to piss in. And who does that sound like? See, Adolf don't have no wealth. So y'all can play this game like none of these things matter because you're going to be rich tomorrow or you can start dealing with today. Call it what's your name? Where you calling from? Hello? What's your name? Where you calling from? Uh, give me your take, um, Joseph. Well, exactly what they wanted it to be. This is all planned. We were, we were turned out to perish. We were given our freedom, but none of, the, none of our country had anything we need to, to be free and arrive with. And that's the same thing that's happened today. We're still free, and we're free to perish. You've been telling us this for 10 years now. You know, when you first told us about this economic crunch, you, you said we were going to be broke at 20, 50. You said, we're already broke. So here we are. We broke down and we're doing the politics. Those out of us that are, are, are down and doing the politics and the rest of them. Because, how do I put it? The people that have made up their minds to die this way, we can't save them. But those of us that know better and doing better and working and standing on our squares, we let you go. We, 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 we've been prepared for this. We ain't behind the curve on this. We've known we've been broke for, for the longest. All right, so we man. know it's reparations of Paris. I'm a, I'm and going, I appreciate I'm a, the work you let, let me say this. Man, you've called it a couple of times, and I always appreciate your calls. I'm, a, I'm, I'm keeping it brief with like 60 seconds each call. But, like, thank you so much for calling in and support, man. You always come with that heat. I'm glad you didn't get into it because I know you can get this to it. You'd be coming with it. Okay, but appreciate your talk. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, man. Look, I'm going to take quick hits. I'm going to let everybody try to get their voice off because I got a whole queue here. Caller, what's your name? Where you calling from? Hello? All right. Caller, what's your name? Where you calling from? I think a lot of people here are just, I don't know if they're, they're not here. Let me see. I got a whole queue. Caller, what's your name? Where you calling from? Yeah, hi, Tom. This is Juanita. I'm calling from Atlanta. Juanita, let me read something to you, and then I'm going to come right to you. I'm 30 years old, and I still cannot afford a car. Now, I don't know if this person is black, but it just reflects the moment we're in. I'm about to turn 30 this year, and my father still driving me to work since buying a car isn't an option for me. In his passenger seat, looking out the window, I often remember the untranslatable wealth uh, uh, waited um, a malleable longing for a home that never was. Perhaps it is because this word tenderly holds the entirety of our father-daughter relationship. I became daddy's girl on the road through decades and thousands of miles in different places. We've made home. Um, I'll skip down. 
uh, basically, this this woman, millennials are dubbed the new lost generation, coming out, coming of age in the global financial crisis of 08. We're entering the workforce in an economic downturn more severe than the Great Recession, while saddled with the soaring student debts. We're a generation of side hustles and gig cultures stuck in cycles of low-paying jobs and stagnant wages. Gen Zers are also facing the same dilemma. They come back and used cars are up 30% over two years. Uh, older models, the average price for a nine-year-old car is up 43%. What's your take on everything? I just, you know what? I, I think that anybody that's eight off that doesn't see what's going on, they just, they stupid. There's no nice way to put it. I just went to the grocery store and there was hardly any milk in the up there. I mean, that should tell you something right there. We just can't even buy food. And then the food that's there costs twice as much as it did this time last year. It's yeah. something just that simple. And I was listening, you know, talking about my whole household making $38,000 and how uh, Adolf's men are unemployed. And that's because they get these bullshit felony convictions. And once you get a felony charge on you, you can't get a job anywhere. Decent. It's because any could be for probably twenty five dollars. If it's a felony, you got a felony conviction. That same one with Luke Byron if he get called, his parents could get a lawyer, a real lawyer. He pay a little fine and uh don't And also and also one need to let's not forget. Let's not forget, you live in a red state. So a lot of black people of moving course. they moving their black babies into red states without looking at what is the police like where you go move your baby at? What is the police like where you gonna move your black son into? Because the house cheap. So add all that up in there. Exactly. You have to add it up. And the only thing I'm gonna say, and I've been saying it, when you see white folks on TV. Crying about college tuition, crying about how their kids won't uh, won't be able to get into a, a start of home. Talking about how even though they change the amount of money that they can give through a gift to the down payment, everybody don't have enough for all of the kids to get a down payment. When you see them on oh, that kind of stuff and they crying, what does that make you think your life is like as eight up? Mm-hmm. I, you know, that old saying that when the um, nature catches the cold, Adolf catches pneumonia. We got we got something worse than pneumonia. We got pneumonia, COVID all together. We on the back ventilator. And a lot of people ain't gonna know it until they pass out because they ain't going to the to the hospital. They don't want to come to the Tone Talks Hospital. Well, neither. Let me take a few more callers. We don't want it. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. When I, I'm just gonna say, I'm just gonna say this. I. Any person that's eight off, that's still living in a green world thinking that they're going to send their kids to college and 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 that their kids are going to come out and make all this money and they don't contribute nothing toward it, they don't have no tuition. And I'm not talking about anybody's baby, but everybody's not going to get a full ride to school. If folks are still thinking like that, they're setting their kids up for frustration and failure. Some, like somebody just about. screamed out your name. I put it on screen. Miss Marlena. Bye. Uh, thank you for calling. Oh. oh, man. She do be coming with it, don't she? Don't she? I love Juanita, too. And, you know you know it's something when they start knowing your your voice. I know when Juanita comes through because it starts smelling like sweet potato and greens. I'm just telling you. <laughs> Call her, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Yes, my name is Bobby. I'm from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, and go ahead, go I, ahead. Don't, let, don't even let me. I'm, go uh, ahead. Let me get out your way. Well, anyway, um, I work at a university. Okay. Now, I won't say the name, but it's in the bedroom. And I have spent two years walking the campus trying to find one person. If I ask them ACOS, both police and students and faculty, no one knows. I haven't found one yet. And it just really, really makes me angry because I look at time in an equation. The word just that, just that variable time. We have the pleasure of sleeping, of being awoke, and we don't have time to sleep anymore. 
And I don't know what to do. I'm so angry and so frustrated. But all I can say is I'm 65 years old, and I can actually say that maybe I can make it through my next year yep. without consequences. But I have children, and I have grandchildren, Come and I have family. None of them, no one that I know can do this. And I cannot get them to understand that unity is the only thing that we have now. That's it. And it has to be up on the flag. And I hope that you're going to, you are going to produce a flag soon. ADOS. And we need to fight so hard to get ADOS put on everything that we have to check off and everything that we do. And we got to fight for reparations. Yeah, I just tweeted. I just tweeted the guy, the the gentleman who's the census director, less than a week ago. I I I asked him the same thing. The census director just put up his Twitter for the first time because we should be on the census. But part of what you're seeing um, on, on your campus is, I believe there was a massive suppression attempt because Ados was catching fire to cast us as right wing. Again, I voted Democrat my whole life. I was down ballot Democrat on Obama both terms because it's Obama. And then the second thing, but I voted Democrat down ballot. Um, and then oh, oh, you got to understand, Yvette Carnell, she, you got people calling Yvette right wing that have done nothing political in their life. Yvette Carnell worked as a congressional aide for Democratic sen- two Democratic senators, like a congressman and a senator, actually. So, like, how, you got people, I think Jamil Hill, her mama voted for Trump. Turn around, talk about, like, Black men and how they vote. No, fix your mama first. Jamil Hill from ESPN formerly. And I'm just saying, like, right now, you got black rappers that were for opportunity zones that met with Tim Scott, like Charlemagne met with Tim Scott, and nobody wants to deal with that. So there's a mechanized thing that's going on here, and I don't know how deep it runs. And it, and they knew ADOS was catching fire, and they started really suppressing our movement. That's just what my feeling is. Well, I'm a, I got a couple more well, callers. Go ahead and say your last I, word. All I want to say is that I thank you and Yvette for giving me life first. And secondly, I just hope that before I can leave, before I leave this planet, that unity can come in a woke mind. Come on. And we can get on the job of saving ourselves for our children and those that are going to come after us. Come on. Come on. Thank you so much. I'm gonna take. I'm gonna take- oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. I thought you had hung up already. Um, thank you so much for uh, all of the support. I love Yvette too. At times, no, I'm just messing with y'all. I love Yvette. I just talked to Yvette earlier today. I talk about her every day. Um, look, I'm gonna take one more caller. I got uh, about seven, eight callers. Sorry, I can get to everybody. I'm gonna take him. Caller, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Six six two. Uh, this is Sean from Mississippi. What's your oh. take? You, you better end the show right, Sean. Everybody gonna be mad at you. Come on with it. Okay. Now, now, I just want to say that, you know, I went to high school. I went to college. I got my degree in accounting. I got a, I got a three, three. I worked in corporate America for 10 years, okay? After those 10 years, I went through a, a stint where I couldn't even find work, you know, for that whole year. And I actually had to get to a point where I had to get a survival mode, and I had to get a CDL and start driving truck because I couldn't find it, anything out here. So I could definitely relate to that article because I had to, you know, I had to, you know, uh, change careers even though I didn't want to drive a truck, but I had to do it to survive. And, and, and like I say, man, it's just, it just messed up for us out here. And, and, let, me, and, and let, let me add in, you know, you know, it, it's tough all around. And, like, I appreciate y'all because a lot of y'all support. I pay my student loans with this, this money in part. So I got my own job regularly, but it, it allows me without having the parental support at all uh, and familial support and well in terms of wealth, I appreciate all of y'all little donations and support. Also to be able to get new equipment like a webcam or new camera or lighting or things of the sort. So man, man I appreciate all y'all as well because you know, it, it, we a family, we're gonna try to keep building. It's tough out here, but we need to know what the numbers are. We are gonna be out here Acting like it's easy breezy when it's tough out here. This is Tone Talks. Please go to tonetalks.org, subscribe and donate, share this video. We went a little long today, but it was necessary. Two-hour show. Uh, Hopefully the calls were helpful. Thank you so much.